Okay, well, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Alex Dietier, who has come all the way from Japan. Uh, he's currently a postdoc at Kaido University, in the University of Lancaster. Um, before that, he was at uh, University of Exeter in the UK, uh, working with quite a lot. Um, and he's been in Canada for actually the last month trying to escape the Japanese and <laughs> have a slightly milder one here. Um, so, you have to do. Thanks very much, Richard. Yep, good afternoon everybody. As uh, so introduced, I'm Alex. I've come here from Hokkaido, which is Hokkaido University. And I'm here to talk to you today about the morphology of spiral galaxies with a specific focus on our own galaxy, the Milky Way. This is going to be mostly my PhD work, which I finished in October last year, with a little bit towards the end of the work I'm currently doing in Hokkaido at the moment uh, with Elizabeth. So before we Quick icebreaker, where on earth am I from? I'm working in a city called Sapporo. This is the city. And this is in, here's the world for you. This is Japan. This island here is Hokkaido, which looks a bit like this. And Sapporo is there, which is where the beer comes from and where Hokkaido University is. And you ask people, what do you know about Sapporo? Well, they get a lot of snow, they have really nice food. Yeah, and the scenery is really nice. And yeah, lots and lots of snow. To prove my point, is a six-story sculpture of Darth Vader in characters from Star Wars that was made in the winter of this year. I, think I tore it down in the end. Cool. So I'm going to talk to you about spiral galaxies. Most of you are very familiar, I assume, with these grand design, beautiful-looking spiral patterns you see in the night sky. You have the poster child of spiral galaxies, M51 up here, which is these very strong outer two-arm spiral mode. And this guy as well, M81, which has the spiral arms more towards the outer edge of the disk. Then you have the bar-driven spiral arms, these guys here with a very long inner bar region that is believed to drive these outer arms. And then you have the more intermediate kind of subjects where they have a very small inner bar, like these guys down here, and this slightly more flocculent and less well-defined outer arm structure, like these here. And we have more examples of these are pushing more towards the flocculent regime, and you have this clearly a spiral-like in nature, but you can't really stick a number of arms on that. We refer to these as flocculent galaxies. And this is a very similar one to the previous, a very small inner bar here, but no real distinct arm pattern towards the outer edge of the disk. Then you have the kind of weirder ones, such as NGC 4725, which has an inner bar and a ring, and maybe just a single arm feature coming out from the center. And then you have these anemic spirals, as they're called, which have a spiral pattern, but it's very ill-defined and not very well fit for any kind of arm mode. And then you have the ones that are just plain odd, such as this ESO object here, which has spiral arms, but these point against the direction of rotation, so the disk is actually going this way. Don't ask me how that works. And you have M64 down here, which is this extremely bright, or extremely dark inner dust region. And it's believed to have a central part of this disk. This galaxy extends quite far. But this central part is believed to rotate in the opposite direction to the outer edge of the disk, which is, again, who knows what's going on there. So we've shown you lots of different features, and there's pretty pictures. And there's still kind of a question as to what drives these spiral structures. Why do galaxies look like they look like? I'm specifically talking about disk galaxies today, not ellipticals or anything funny like that. So you can see we've got some examples here of different arm spiral modes, ranging from one to who knows what spiral number we're looking at here. One of the main problems with building a theory of spiral generation is the winding problem. And what this basically means is because your galaxy usually has a flat rotation curve, this means that any fixed pattern that you see on its surface will wind up as the galaxy rotates. This is undergrad stuff, but it basically means that any spiral pattern that you see after a few rotations of the disk, the spiral pattern will wind up. So you have to have some way of counteracting this. The arm can't really be material and fixed in nature if the disk galaxy has a flat rotation curve. So the textbook way of dealing with this is what's called the spiral density wave theory of Lin and Shu from the 1960s where you overcome this problem by not having spiral arms that are fixed structures. These are instead density waves. So what these are is a set of aligned orbits in such a way that you generate the appearance of a spiral arm, but these spiral arms are not constant throughout time. Right? Your material in the spiral arm does not live in it for its duration. So I've got some examples here of just some orbits that are correctly aligned that you'll see such a pattern. So these are a bunch of elliptical orbits of some epicycle frequency, which means how often it has a radial oscillation in one complete orbit. So this is a, oscillates twice in one complete orbit, and you can align these in such a way that you'll see a two-arm spiral pattern. If you delay the amount of offset, you'll get a bar in the middle. You can generate three-arm spiral patterns and four-arm spiral patterns in this way. And these are not fixed structures, as I, as I said. They are waves. So think of them as a traffic jam. So a traffic jam slowly moves along. 
cars go in and out of it, but you don't stay in the traffic jam. The traffic jam is an object and cars move in and out. So that's kind of what this is. You have a wave that propagates and moves around, but the material does not stay in it. So this is all very well and good, and you have the theory, there's a bunch of paperwork and, numeric and theory on this. You have a pattern speed, which is basically the rotation speed of your pattern that you see, not the rotation of the material, but the rotation of the pattern, so the two-arm pattern will rotate at some speed. And this is a diagram here as a function of radius from some Milky Way-like galaxy, and this is the rotation speed of the material in the disk, and it follows this kind of pattern here. If you times this by r, you'll get a rotation curve, right? And if you have the rotation speed of your pattern, which is dictated by this blue band, where this cuts into certain specific regions, which are dictated by these lines. So this is the rotation frequency of the stuff in the disk. This is the black line. So this is the rotation frequency of your gas or your stars in your disk. Plus or minus a fraction of what's called the epicycle frequency, which is what I mentioned earlier. And you get these lines. And where these lines cross your pattern speed region is what are called the Limblad residences. And this is something that exists in theories of like disk structure for planet formation and stuff as well. This basically means you'll get a resonance at these points, a radius in your disk. So in this example, you're about eight and two kiloparsecs from the center. And it's believed that spiral structure or bar structure as well, I guess, will exist between those two resonance regions. And you have co-rotation is where this spiral pattern rotates with the material on the disk. So this is the material rotation, this is the pattern rotation, this is called co-rotation, which is between some inner and outer limb resonance. resonance. Maps aren't important, just illustrating the idea for now. Uh, these resonance regions are quite important because they dictate where your spiral pattern is seen. So here we have some two-arm spirals and some four-arm spirals. These are very simple simulations of a Milky Way-like disk. And you increase the speed that your spiral structure rotates at, and you'll radially contract the features. So here, in this example, this is the inner Limblad resonance here. As you can see, the spiral structure within this does not really follow the spiral structure out of it. So this is a very clear, wide pitch angle spiral. Inside the resonance, it winds up and you lose your spiral structure. You increase your speed, and this inner resonance region moves inwards. You increase it again, it moves into here. And then you get the outer limb blood resonance is beginning to appear here. So you can see this material is being churned up. And beyond this, you wouldn't see a spiral pattern. So just to illustrate a quick simulation, I'm going to subject a disk of gas to some forearm spiral pattern. And the gas just flows in and out, in and out, and traces your spiral pattern, but only inside a limb bad resonance, which is here. So you won't see anything of a spiral pattern here. The outer resonance is beyond the edge of the disk, so you see it throughout from the inner resonance to beyond the disk. So, it's all very well and good. So spiral density waves, sure, but this has never been reproduced in simulations, setting up, numerical simulations that is, setting up a spiral density wave that persists with material flowing in and out of it has yet to be done. And also not really observed not really observed, like how do you tell you have a spiral density wave and not just a material arm? This is a very sticky area. No one's really pinned down these spiral density waves in any way, shape, or form yet. Maybe some people might in the future. So you can measure something called a pattern speed as well for galaxies, and people used to assume this was constant. But when people try and assess the pattern speed as a function of radius, you actually begin to see it slopes, which is a sign of it being a material arm. So. It's within question. And another, another problem that some people sometimes overlook is that these aren't even steady density waves. Over time, they have a dispersion. They'll decay away. And you need something else to reseed and give the spiral density waves a push and a, re, a reseeding, as it were, get it going again. What makes this hard to simulate? This seems like it would be a pure in-body type effect. Uh, just to get it. So you need to set up. Uh, you need to set these orbits up right and get it to everything to be perfectly aligned like this. And sure, you can put a star down and a star down and a star down, give them an orbit and tell them, follow this. But they won't keep it. It will all churn up and move around and they'll form, they will form spiral structures, but they're not the same. I'll show you in a minute the spiral structures you do see in simulations. The simulation you showed next, what was that? So I've put a potential in there. So there's no star particles. There's some gas being exposed to a forearm potential. So that is reproducing a wave. So the gas fall, goes in and out of the wave. I thought it was a fixed potential. Yeah. Ah, okay. So that's why, you, that's why that works, because I've told it to. But get, getting, the, getting the stars to do it is the problem. So setting up the density wave with a live disk of stars is where the problem lies. So another method is generating it off the end of a bar. This is 
you get these arms trailing off the bar end. And once again, this is determined by where your resonance region is. And they'll wrap around at the outer limb blood resonance again. And they'll, they'll come effectively circular at this point. Uh, here's another quick little video of I'm going to subject this gas to another potential of a bar in the center. And it's going to rapidly rotate around. And you'll see the arms that it forms. And it's circular when it gets to the outer radius. And you get these funny shapes that are called X2 orbits, which are where your inner limb bad resonance is. So these are very easy to form in n body simulations. Once you've formed a bar, they'll almost always have an arm trailing off the end of it. And it's just, I said, these funny orbits. Look into a mass if you want. I'm not going to explain it here. So once again, as I said, the outer arm regions will contract as the speed of your arms increase, speed of your bar increases. This is a very slow bar. This is a very fast moving bar. And the arms that it's formed off the edges contract inwards as the bar rotates rapidly. And as such, as it rotates enough time, say 10 or 20 orbits or so, you'll get a ring forming around the edge. But this is not necessarily a problem. In many bar galaxies that we observe, you'll see a ring at some distance or the arms circulating around. So for example, here is a bar and some very light arms coming off in a ring around it. And similar here, this has formed almost a ring-like structure at the edge of its arms. And people have managed to make bars have a natural insulation. Correct, right? yeah. Right. So that, that's, yeah, I'll, getting there in a, a few slides from now. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the other method, so this is what generally comes out of n-body simulations. These are transient spiral structures. So I've got some videos coming up. But, so spiral arms can be made in simulations. But these are not steady standing waves. <coughs> material does not flow in and out of a density wave. The material stays with the arm until the arm gets sheared away, or the arm comes apart again with the differential rotation of the disk. And um, looking to the work by people like Kichi Wada and Rob Grand for the details on this, and Jerry Selwood as well. Some people call these swaves just to differentiate them from the other method. And problem being, these arms will wind, so they have no fixed pattern speed. They have a pattern speed that is a function of the rotation of your disk. They can be introduced in simulations, but you have, a very, you have to be very careful about your resolution, because you might accidentally see these. If your resolution isn't high enough, they'll decay over about a gig a year. So there's a fine line between what you see and being a numerical effect. But on the plus side, you can generate a great very many types of morphologies using, with these kind of theory, so just having material arms that come and go. And you can get by the winding problem in that they gen regenerate over time. So you'll see a three-armed or four-armed structure appear, They'll shear away, but the material that gets sheared away will then form another arm structure in its wake. So it's transient yet regenerating. Yeah, sorry, as I said before, fixed pattern speed maybe not even has to be seen in external galaxies. There have been some observations of a pattern speed that does decay with the radius. So it's a very simple simulation of this. I've got a disk of stars on the left, disk of gas on the right, and I'm just going to let it evolve. The gas is being exposed to the stars. I've just separated them for you here. And you'll see, as it rotates, let it settle for a bit. The middle's a mess because there's no bulge in there at the moment. I'll show you one with that in, the, in a second. And you'll see these arms begin to form, the outer edge of your disk. But if you track an arm, it will shear away. Bits of it will come apart. It'll spray away from the rest of the arm. The gas traces it very strongly. It doesn't really float in and out. The gas stays with the arms. There's no offset between the trough of the potential of the gas and the stars. They're with each other until they get sheared apart. So they're transient yet recurrent. They keep going. And as was asked, you can generate bars very easy with this. There's a simple video here of a disk I let going for about three giga years. And you'll see this twofold um, bisymmetric pattern in the middle. And you can generate little bars quite easily. But this generation of a bar, you have to have what's called a lack of a Q barrier. So this is the tomb ray Q parameter. So this basically means without a bulge in the center of your disk, there was no bulge in this galaxy. It's just a flat exponential disk. Without a bulge, you're very susceptible to bar formation. The heavier a bulge you put in, you generate a barrier, and no bar can be formed. OK? So there's some pictures of what happens. If you have a very weak bulge, so you can still, there's some overlap between heavy, having a heavy bulge and stopping a bar having a very light bulge. At a very light bulge, you'll generate these orbits, as I showed you in the potential before. So you can generate these features of a ring inside the center of a disk galaxy. And yeah, generating bars, in a way, is too easy in simulations. So eventually, almost every disk will form a bar at some point, looking into the tens of gig years region. 
So this is, isn't necessarily a problem when you consider a lot of disk galaxies have a bar, say 30 to 50 percent, but still, in many simulations, bar generation is overabundant. Oh, this is a pretty picture to show that I'm not talking crazy. Here's a bar of galaxies from our simulations and a picture of NG, uh, M100. Sorry, that word shouldn't be there. And you can see the arms here trace out very similarly to the arms in this picture here. And you can see the region where the gas is in falling to the center here is similar to what's going on here. There's no stars plotted in this map, so this is a lot brighter than what appears here. May I ask why you're distinguishing old and borrowed? Isn't it now the way the gold is the borrowed? Yeah, but in a simulation, if you want it, yeah, in the Milky Way it is an overlap. But in a simulation, you want to be able to see what structures you generate. So you put a bulge in the middle to make sure your rotation curve matches what you want to see. And in these simulations, this, this object here is a mix of your bulge particles and your disk particles. So what you have set up in the center to have, a, say, a bulge with random orientation orbits. You set up density profile. Sure. With the rotation curve. Mm -hmm. And then it naturally develops bars, which can be interpreted as a bulge. Yeah, because it has the bulge particles intermixed with it. Now we get a bit more sophisticated and now put a very dense bulge in the center. And we've got the, disc, the gas in the disk again. And you'll see things are much, well, a little bit less irregular in the center. You have very fast moving material in the middle because we now have a bulge, the center of our rotation curve. And again, you'll see these spiral arms appearing and then eventually shearing out. And we'll attach to this arm eventually as the whole thing rotates around. So you can generate spiral arms of n-body simulations, but they're not the same as the spiral density waves of Lin and Shu. So we're going to look at a bit of a take case study now. And this is, the, as I said, the project of my PhD work, which is what is the structure of our Milky Way galaxy? Now we've explained to you a bit of theory. We're going to move on to actually putting any of this into practice. So the structure of our Milky Way, discerning all of this has been a bit of a problem for decades now, because we're inside it. Right? It's like me asking you right now, what is the shape of this building? You can't move, but I might drill some holes in the walls and open a window or something so you can get a bit of an idea. But it's been very difficult to do. You can get distance determinations, but some of these have some nasty uncertainties, and you can never see anything beyond the central bulge either, or you can, but it's extremely difficult to do. And this is still a problem. So we have an idea of the rotation curve, but defining exactly how many spiral arms there are, what are their pitch angles, how fast is all this material rotating, how far are we from an arm? What's going on with the local arm very near us? Still a lot in question as to what's happening here. So the, you've probably all seen this artist's interpretation before from Churchill et al. 2009. This is kind of the, the standard, what we sort of think the Milky Way looks like, so a bar object in the center and two or four arm spiral structure. And here are some, oh, I have a question mark. Here are some external galaxies that are of similar shapes. So a small bar in the center with an arm structure of some kind in the outer disk. That's another one. So as I said, the current paradigm is two or four arms and at least one bar. There is even some observational evidence that we might have two bars in the center. A very dumpy, wide, short bar, and then a long, thin bar. Sorry, we're here in this diagram on the Orion spur or arm, whatever you want to call this. And some Perseus arm and the Scutum crux or the Centaurus arm, and then two some believe to be weaker arms, the Norma and the Sagittarius arms around them. And this is an example of the observational data that goes into this kind of artist interpretations that I showed you. If you take away the spiral arms for any of these, you kind of understand that there's a bit of a jump from data like this to the spiral arm models, the spiral arm picture that I showed you. I mean, sure, this thing. And this is the center of the galaxy, and we're up here, by the way. You can see this large amount of scatter in all the material new. This is why it's very hard to pin down the location of like the local R material. And here's a, one of the more older maps from Kerr 1962. If anything, things got more confusing, I'd say. You've got some spiral arms here, and again, nothing beyond the galactic center. And then things get confusing still if you look in the outer disk. So this is very much in the outer part from 10 to 20 kiloparsecs, or 25 even. And you have these, what well, maybe trace, this is H1 data, maybe tracing out spiral arms, but these are much, much wider than the spiral arms that are being traced here. So there's clearly something is not gelling quite right. This is a very wide arm. These are very tight and you know, wound. You can take a step back and measure tangencies to the arms. So this is galactic longitude looking through the disk. And this is some emission from carbon and nitrogen. And if you look around in your disk, if you look along a spiral arm, you expect this to increase as you look down a tangency. And from this, you can pin down a little bit better where your spiral arms are. So this is the tangency 
of the Sagittarius arm, I think, on the left, yeah. So you can kind of pin down spiral tangentes from this, but again, the point to take home is going from all this to the artist's interpretation I showed you before and the one that's put around in press releases and stuff is quite a jump. And there's still quite a bit of uncertainty on what it all actually looks like, let alone how, much, how fast all of it is rotating. So what I did for my project was to try and reverse engineer a top-down map of the Milky Way, that's the goal product. But to do so, rather than looking at distances and data, I used numerical simulations and looked at the velocity structure. So some of you may be similar to these kind of maps before, but I'll show you what I mean. So here's the observer inside a Milky Way-like disk, very boring. Here's the middle, and here's the velocity structure of that disk. So this is looking in the center, zero degrees longitude, and this is looking right behind you at 180. So this wraps around your head when you're looking towards the galactic center. And so that's the kind of pattern you'd see from a very flat featureless disk. This, the shape of this is determined by your rotation curve. If I were to put some spiral arms on this disk, these over densities, you'd see them appear as these features in the longitude velocity plot, that's what we call this. So you can see this red arm has gone from the center in here and it's passed right in front of you at very local velocities as it's come towards you and then out into the outer edge of the disk. And similar with this guy, it's passed in front of you, just here, and then passed over behind you now into the outer edge and it's picked up back here again. So we have some observational data for this. Here is the H1 data from Cabaret on 2005. And you begin to see the kind of things I illustrated. So you have a, maybe a, a Perseus spiral arm down here. This is the local arm, local material, an outer arm, and some spiral arm here. I call it the Carina hook. It's believed to be from the Carina arm, and it hooks right around here before you enter this quadrant. And then you have this kind of messy swath of stuff towards the middle that is believed to be either a mixture of rings or bars or even spiral arms towards the center. But H1 is everywhere. We want to make things a bit more simple and look at CO data instead, which would be to trace the, obviously the denser regions of the gas in the disk. And you can see very similar things. So this Carina arm here and this Perseus arm and the local arm is here, a bit fainter now though. And you now have this very strong diagonal swath here that has been attributed to a ring on occasion. Some people think it's a ring, some people think it's a spiral arm curving in inside line of sights. And you have this very strong high peak called the central molecular zone, which is believed to be in the center of the galaxy. So what, I, what my project involved and what my work and my papers were about reproducing these kind of maps from numerical simulations. So I'd make some simulations, assuming some arm um, bar morphology, put myself inside, and then construct these maps and see how well a fit we get. If you get a good fit, you've got a good map of the galaxy. That's the, that's the idea behind it all. And so we began, we have used SPH simulations, I'm not going to get into the details of this. You discretize the fluid into a bunch of little blobs, and you move it all around. The gas itself is subject to a plethora of heating and cooling mechanisms, so ISM heating and cooling. And all of your gas tracks H1, H2, and CO. So there's a basic chemical network in each of the particles. And the videos look very similar to the ones I showed you before. Here's just another quick one of a barred spiral galaxy. And see, so this, this is actually colored by CO density now, so these are high density CO regions are the bright colored regions here. And we then, someone say anything or am I going mad? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and we would then stick ourselves inside this, use another code, an AMR radiative transfer code, and then calculate correct opacities and column densities, and then generate synthetic maps. Of course, you have one other problem with doing this kind of thing, so you have to assume where the observer is. If you're looking at stuff in longitude velocity space, you have to very carefully pick what your velocity and position is. So there's another free parameter as well as the arms and the bars and the angles and the speeds everything is rotating at. So we again have to cycle through generating many maps using different positions and velocities of the observer. Not changing by much, but say changing the velocity from 200 to 240 kilometers per second to keep it within observational errors, but let you have that bit of freedom to change your map to find a good fit. And then we'd simply vary parameters and use a chi-squared like fit statistic over the maps to get a handle on some of these properties. For example, here is a plot using many simulations and this is the bar angle, theta b. So zero degrees is the bars looking right at you, 45 degrees is here, 108 degrees is here. And so these are many different observer velocities here and you'll see the one that has the best fit has an angle of about 45 degrees, which is kind of what we think for the long bar. 
and the best fit about 220 kilometers per second, which is good. So this kind of adds up. So this is the, the this is the longitude velocity. Ah, sorry. Well, this is this stuff basically. This is the the gas tracing a bar, which is then which is then constrained to that of those maps I showed you. That CO day map. Yeah. Uh, so the material. I've got some maps coming. So for example, there's the data, and these are maps of just bars. So this is where the CO is moved as a result of having a bar in the center. Yeah, so this is CO emission maps, synthetic CO emission maps, these three here, three different speeds of your bar. And this is the observational data. So you see, you can get all right matches and get, generate this kind of feature in the center. Very similar, but using a bar alone, so there was text here that I've gotten rid of. So we get a good fit to our bar pattern speed of about 50 to 60 kilometers per second per kiloparsec. Sorry, those units are nuts. It's just a rotation frequency. And we get good orientations of about 45 degrees, which is, again, what observations kind of suggest. Uh, the problem being, the arms driven by a bar alone do not reproduce all the features that you want. So as I showed you here, these are just bars, and you get very little. The arms do not really get to the outer edge of your disk. And the further out they get, the stronger this horrible swath of emission is to the observer. So we did not find very good fits of just using a bar alone to reproduce the CO emission. Well, this is kind of fine, because we sort of already knew to a degree that it has to be outer spiral arm structure. So we take a step forward, and we then put arm potentials in as well, and subject the gas to a bunch of arm potentials. So we can fit stuff like the pattern speed of the arms, in either a forearm or two arm models with a variety of different pitch angles. A pitch angle is how tight your spiral arm is. So if it's five degrees, it's very tight. If it's 20 degrees, it's a very wide spiral arm. As you see in both of these models, there's a kind of a dip and a lowest fit for about 20 kilometers per second per kiloparsec, which is about in the middle of where observations say it should be. There's a secondary dip here for some of the two arm models. And this is due to some strange resonance features that I'm not going to explain right now. Look at the paper if you're interested. Both of these two arm forearm models have their merits, and this is kind of the problem. So the forearm models, here's some examples here. These are forearmed models, these are two arm models, and here's observational data. Two arm models don't have enough stuff. You'll never generate everything you need. So for example, this guy here has a local arm, a persis arm, and an outer arm, which is what we see here. But the middle emission is incorrectly orientated. This Carina hook is in completely the wrong place where we need it to be. So the two arm models don't really produce enough. We move to a four arm model, and your problem now is you get far too bright features where you don't want them to constrain the right arm features. So each of these, they reproduce some features correctly, but not others. So using these arm features alone in a standard potential of a spiral density wave, you cannot really reproduce these kind of features. So, so these, the spiral arms in here work like you force them in the potential Correct. Have them going. Yeah. So they're not the transients. No, no, that's, that's coming. Right. So, yeah. So we then put the arms and bars together. So this is, again, the gas being subjected to some potentials. And you can get better matches, but we're still not perfect. So you can generate local arm material, outer arm material, and you're getting a bit better now. What's my picture gone? You're getting a bit better now with keeping an arm here, but you still have this very strong ridge of material which is where this arm has come right in front of the observer here. In order to fit this arm feature here, it has required this very strong swath of stuff right in front of you, which is not really what we see in the observations. So this flicks up to much higher velocities. Are there any particular degeneracies you found when you were starting to try to vary all these parameters? To a degree, but not as many as you'd think. That's not the real challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, I mean, this is a time-dependent simulation, so the future continues to change, so you're fitting at different times. Yes, yeah, so we fit multiple different time steps as we go as well. So when you say a chi-square minimum, it somehow at some point it looks the best. Yeah, so... So, uh, so now we have to vary the position of the Earth, so you have to vary the time where this is going, you get very potential of the galaxy, you can vary gas density, what else? I had a lot of maps. <laughs> it, took a, it took a very long time. And Buy eye checks as you go. Is the only so I follow the fist statistics 
And so I didn't look at, well, I did look at all the maps, but I didn't study each one in minute detail. I, by, I checked, this one has a low fit, yeah, it looks rubbish. This one has a high fit, oh yeah, that is a good one. And you can do that quite quickly, and generating the maps is very much a pipeline process once you've got it all set up. But the simulations, again, will take like three weeks for each one to do the chemistry and have a good enough resolution to produce the CO. So it's not quick, and there's a lot of maps that are taking up space somewhere. Right, uh, stop me blabbering the map for a second. I'm going to give you a movie. Uh, here we are. How do I full screen this sucker? So <laughs> this is our best fitting map from this study where we have. So this is our best fitting map. I'm simply going to show you it's nothing that I haven't already told you. It just produces it much nicer. So here's the longitude velocity data. This is where you are in this disk. So that's where you're looking, and that's where it'll appear. I'll let the disk evolve. These are the different maps that you'll get at different times. As you can see, this material is being selected to four arms and a bar potential. This, it's, we've stopped here at the best fitting point. And there's all the features, if you want to read them. And so we can then, ah, we just kind of zoom in around now. So you can see you've got this bar like structure in the center that has fit the peak velocities from this ring. And you see these arm material that came around here, some of it being generated by rotation of the bar, some of it being generated by the spiral potentials. And again, here is the data, and here is this mock synthetic observation that we've made. So let's head on back. Are these disks all flat? Uh, to a degree, there's nothing really apart from their own dispersion there's, and the potential not being a slice. There's nothing really to stop them condensing down, but they are effectively flat. There's no end body, right? It's just smooth, flat potentials with a minimum at z equals zero. But that will change here. So now we're looking into instead, so that we learned some things from that. We got some minima of some properties. But now we're going to take things up a gear and replace all of our potentials with end body stellar disks. So this is a bit more of a complicated and time consuming process. But to do so, we effectively put a disk in the center with a varying mass. So each time we wanted to reproduce the rotation curve of the Milky Way, like you see here. But we slightly varied the disk and the halo contribution. So in this example here, you have a heavy disk. The disk is indicated by the blue line. And a moderate halo. And in this one here, you have a very light disk. And a heavier halo. So sorry, can I interrupt? Just to understand what you did in the first part. You, you didn't do any in body. You just put in... There's lots the of potentials. Potential and, and put some gas in. And then SPH for the hydro. Correct, yeah effectively reproducing spiral density waves, right? You have a wave of stuff, your gas flows in and out of a trough. So now, rip that out, and we put some live, live, bleh, some live particles in to reproduce the stars. And the reason we vary the disk mass is because your weight of your disk mass determines the spiral arm number that you'll be form forming. So if you have a very heavy disk, your arm mode that you're driving will be quite low. If you have a very light disk, you're moving more towards a flocculent multi-arm structure. So to show you what's going on here, this is a very heavy disk. This is evolution left to right. Stars, gas. When you, I've got lots of these plots. The stars look like this, the gas look like this. Just stop me saying this a million times. So in this example here, you've driven a three-arm structure in the mid-disk and a two-arm structure in the inner disk. If I then decrease the mass of the stellar disk, you've gone down to more of a four-arm structure in the mid-disk. If I decrease the mass of the stellar disk once more, you're getting to more of a five-arm structure. There's lots of material now. It's less clear what spiral arm mode you're driving. And if you decrease it once more, you're effectively flocculent. It's very difficult to pull out by eye or with the Fourier transform what kind of modes are driving here. So by varying the disk mass, we look at different spiral arms that can be formed from these transient and recurrent spiral arm features. And these are very, this is the same videos that I showed you much earlier with the stellar and the gas potentials. These are the same models that was used for this. Uh, some global results from this kind of, of this work. You get pitch angles that are quite a bit wider than the best fits from previously. So these are more like 20 to 25 degrees, whereas previously we were looking at 15 degrees. Uh, your spiral arms, you can drive anything from two to a near flocculent arm disk. One interesting thing is that as you saw from some of those pictures, your spiral arm number is not constant through your disk. You can generate maybe a two-arm feature in the middle, three arms on the inner disk, and maybe four arms on the outer disk. So this is something to keep in mind. The arm number is not really constant, but it almost varies throughout your disk. You seem to get a dominant mode, but it's not 
global. And the pattern speed is not constant, so these arms are winding, and it decays as a function of radius. So they will wind, they will decay, but again, they will come back again as another arm is formed in its wake. And these are the maps compared to the observations. There they are. So here's observational data, and here are the best four fitting maps that we got from this part of the study. And this is shown next to the gas. I've uh, not plotted the stars, just for clarity. As you can see, we're getting much better now that we've replaced the potential with a live disk. This example in particular, these two are the same models, but just at different timestamps. This is a very light model, this is a very heavy, no, this is a light model, this is a heavy model. As you can see here, we have this very long diagonal ridge of emission, which is similar to what you see in observations. And this is from this arm here, and this arm here. And you have this Carina arm coming around correctly in this situation, and this one here. The problem with your disk being quite light is you're not really getting dense enough in the outer disk. So you've lost your arm features in the outer disk here and here because your arms are so weak and you're not driving excuse me, enough dense structure. And with the heavy arms, they weren't as good a match in general because you've got some very strong emission in the middle that wasn't really tracing where you wanted it to trace in the CO maps. So you get much better, map, better fits and results from using a live stellar disk with not a fixed pattern speed for your spiral arms. And something that I really like to do, here's the two best fitting ones, and there's the top down maps. In an ideal world, I'll take the left from that and the right from that, and paste them together to make that, but unfortunately we can't do that. So we believe that if we ran this kind of simulation with enough random seeds, we'd eventually find a good fit to every feature of this map. For example, this part on the left here is a very good reproduction of these arms over here, and likewise with this diagonal feature of this arm here. And there's a zoom in of that, so I'm not talking nonsense. So, what well, you've got to keep in mind is the physics is very simple here. There's no feedback, there's no star formation, there's just gas being subjected to a stellar disk. As you can see, you get some very good results in this outer arm here. is a similar kind of contrast to this outer arm out here. And what's interesting to note that these arms are not the standard spiral density waves. They will come, they will go, they will reform, they will come back again. Some things still need improving with this. The center is still not perfect. So this is the center of the central molecular zone in the observations. And this is it in some of our simulations. This one here with a very strong inner bulge. You can kind of get the material going very fast, but it's still not perfect. These velocities are quite are somewhat lower than what you see in observations. Another problem is you might assume from those maps, there's no bar in the center. And this is kind of a problem for these sort of simulations, also in the literature. It's not just, it's not just me having trouble with this. Generating a good bar in the center while keeping your arms sufficient in your outer disk is quite difficult to do, especially keeping the arms strong enough that they will form enough CO in the dense regions. And as I said a couple of times, there's no constant pattern speed, but do you really need it? As seen by observations, maybe we don't. Maybe spiral arms don't have a constant pattern speed. Okay, and to finish up for the last, what have I got, 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna to talk to you about the work I'm doing at Hokkaido now. So that was all my PhD work, and this kind of flows on to the next stage of looking at things. So I've looked at standard spiral density waves, look to transient flocculent structure. What about spiral line structure that's formed by the passage of some companion, by some tidal forces of some other body interrupting, interfering with your galactic disk? So this, simulations of this kind of nature are by no means new. There's a simulation by Tumrain in 1972, where he had a stellar disk of material, very low resolution, we introduced some perturbing body, and you can drive this two-arm spiral structure, which are quite similar to what you see in observations. So the good thing about this is you can very easily generate two-arm structures that have a near fixed pattern speed. So generating two-arm structures in isolation is quite difficult to do in n-body simulations. You might have noticed I had three arms or four arms. Generating two-arm structures is quite hard to do. They'll either tend to a bar or they'll shear out into three arms very quickly. And the, another problem with these is they're transient, obviously. So once your companion is left, eventually these spiral arms will disappear. They won't stay in your disk for much longer than a gig year or two after your companion has left the system. Uh, this is kind of a neat note. If anyone's ever heard of this before, an experiment by Holmberg in 1942, before the days of computers and what have you, he set up a simulation of two interacting galaxies simulated with a bunch of light bulbs. They effectively calculated the drop-off in light using which are diodes between each other and simulated the gravitational force from this and interacted these two bodies and slowly moved each one along by hand. It's really cool, go look it up. 
So what we're really trying to look at with this, it's seeded by, in a way, can the LMC drive a spiral pattern in the Milky Way? This is like a, a sub-aim of what we're looking at. But in general, how sensitive are your disk galaxies to forming spiral arms from a perturber encounter? So what is the limit of mass, velocity, orbit inclination, where your galaxy is effectively left to its own devices? So there'll be some point where your companion has come in and it will drive a spiral arms, but how sensitive is it to this? And at what point that was not a strong enough encounter, the spiral arms you see must instead be formed in situ and be formed by the disk itself. So you can see uh, tidal encounters or perturbed spiral arms are common, quite common in nature. M51 is the obvious poster child of this. We have this strong companion here is believed to have torn out these two grand design spiral structures here. M81 is more of a group situations. You have two companions, I think, of moderate mass that is believed to have driven these two arm structures. And NGC 2553, which is this, again, similar to M51 and these strong tail and the strong bridge to its, <clears throat> to its companion galaxy. So very similar to what we had before, but we're now going to use a very light disk because we don't really want the galaxy to be forming its own arms. We want to see what happens when we introduce something instead. And this is kind of a starting point a similar starting point to what we'll use. So we'll let the disk evolve for about half a gig a year before we introduce a companion. Here's the stars, here's the gas. There is spiral structure, but you'll almost always get this. But this is very low mode, so it will be very easily drowned out by any encounter. One key difference here is we now have to use a live halo. So normally we'd put a disk and a bulge and gas inside a static halo just to keep things nice and simple, keep computation time as fast as we can make it. But now we're going to perturb the velocity field we, just, we really want to have a field that will, a dark matter field that will adjust to this. So we'll now have a live halo that will deform when your perturber comes in and move the system as a whole. We're keeping out complex physics for now once again, but the idea now is once we've found some good matches, some good reproductions of what we see in the light sky, we'll then effectively throw the book of physics at it and we'll put star formation and feedback and complex heating and cooling in to try and reproduce some synthetic observations. Uh, here's a Quick toy model to show you what I'm talking about if you haven't been listening. So I've got a galaxy in the middle, and I'm going to fire a companion at it. And we've driven some light outer arm structure. It's a simple low resolution toy model. And we're going to come back again. This companion is actually on a barely bound orbit. And we've again seeded a bit more spiral structure in the outer disk. There we go. And you can generate quite a few different structures from doing this. So this example here, you've generated a very large one-arm spiral structure. And we've got some guys that they almost look like. So here's this galaxy from before with this inner, inner disk-like structure and this one arm that comes out. Here's a similar, not exact, because our orbit was in plane. You can generate this a lot better if you set up your orbit exactly. This two-arm structure here coming out from the center. And this weak two-arm spiral mode in outer edge of the disk, which is not too dissimilar to this galaxy here. So I've got another video. Bigger video that is. Can we dim the lights again? Where is my mouse? Here we go. So, going higher resolution now from the little model I showed you before, we have stars and gas, and we're introduced some perturba. I've not plotted the halo, so here we come. So this point mass has then come out and it's driven this two arm spiral structure. You see the galaxy is moving around inside the spiral, inside the dark matter halo. As the galaxy, the perturber moves everything. The perturber is about 10 to the 10 solar masses. See once again, you have a spiral structure, never encounter, and we're moving on into six giga years here, so we're getting quite late in, and eventually we're bound enough that we'll combine with the galaxy. Cool. So, this is some snapshots from that simulation. You can see at certain points. You'll drive a very strong outer spiral mode. And these will wind up over time and become almost circular as the disk rotates and winds the material up and becomes almost back to its initial state once the perturber gets far away enough from the system. And you get multiple interactions on the scale of many gig years. What happens if you make, reduce the mass of your companion? Kind of what you expected. So this is a very heavy companion here. It's driven this very wide arm spiral structure. And this is the stars, this is the gas. If you lower the mass of your companion, not only do you change the path, you've also greatly reduced the amount of spiral structure that you've induced in your stellar and gaseous disk. 
And this is, once again, I'm a sucker for big parameter spaces. There's all sorts of orbital paths and inclinations and masses and velocities you can use. So this is my normal path. I'll come in from the top of the galaxy. What if we come in underneath it? Or what if you come in from above it? And it's interesting to see how does your spiral structure differ? Does it differ? Does it care about your inclination that much? So if you come in from above, you can drive very similar structures. Coming in from underneath, these are just these orientations I've shown you here, just a few examples. You can form very tight wand structures, and it passes just up and over in this kind of orientation here. The interesting note, if you come in the opposite direction, so coming in from this way around this disk here, this is just time along here. If you're moving against the rotation of the disk, it strongly suppresses arm formation, which is somewhat surprising. That you know, you're coming in one direction, you'll drive some very nice spiral structures, you come in the other side, and the disk will very much repress any spiral, motion you're tr spiral arms you're trying to form in it. Isn't it just a pattern speed that's not compatible with the disk? Maybe there are some resonance. So setting this up when it comes in, we believe there might be certain ways you can drive a resonance in it as well, to kind of induce a pattern speed when you come in. So something else we want to check is, can you induce a certain pattern speed by your distance away? There'll be a point where your resonance is. So this is something else we'd like to look into. And you can do some very simple analysis on these models. So here's the arms and stars and the gas here. And what you're looking at in this picture here is the power mode, radius and the power of certain Fourier, certain arm modes. So this is a one arm mode, two arm mode, three arm mode, four arm mode, five, six arm mode. As you can see by eye, it's nothing massively surprising. Your two arm mode dominates in your outer edge of the disk from eight kiloparsecs and up, but it's very weak in the inner disk in this example here. You need quite a strong reaction and tidal encounter to be able to get your spiral arms to push right into the center of the disk, like M51, verging on the point of destroying your galaxy. And this is the pattern speed here. So this is the rotation speed of your arms. It's a function of radius. And ignoring the large error bars in the center, because you, you don't really have the arms in the center, right? That's why it's so bad. And again, your pattern speed is decaying as a function of radius. And this gets worse and worse as your time goes on. And eventually, the spiral arms will wind up. And we're looking at other things as well. For example, replacing the companion, which is effectively a dot in what I just showed you, with a resolve companion, like a small bulge, to better reproduce the LMC, for example. And your, your simulations are surprisingly very similar. But your arm modes are slightly stronger when you use a resolve companion. And this is, you're getting into realms here of galaxy-galaxy interactions here. But this is something else we're going to try and look into. As a last case in point, so I've shown you lots of different types of spiral mode generation, lots of different maps, lots of different simulations. What we'd like to look at in the future is how the gas content, the star formation rates, and the molecular clouds in these galaxies differ between these spiral arm modes. So these are four different simulations, each reproducing different types of morphologies of arms. This has been tidally perturbed. This is a very light disk. This is a very heavy disk. This is a disk that's formed a bar in the center. Each one of them has spiral arms to some degree. But what we'd really like to see and start looking at is how do the clouds in these arms behave differently? Do they behave differently? When you look at the spiral arms in the clouds and the star formation properties in each of these, in the gas in each of these disks, is there a difference in what you see? And this is going to be the next stage in what we we'll like to look at. We're putting in lots more physics, increase the resolution, and look at what the gas is doing. So I'm going to finish off. I've talked to you lots about lots of different spiral arm generation methods, having a bar in the center, having set spiral density waves, having transient disks. If you're trying to reproduce the Milky Way, you pretty much need a four-arm structure to do it. Two arms really won't cut it. And the standard spiral density waves of a fix reproduced here by potentials don't do a very good job at all. They're too, too uniform. They're too, too straight in some instances, and they reproduce too much emission where you don't want it. Instead, using a live disk enables you to get a much better reproduction of these features. And it's very easy to drive, say, two armor spiral structures from tidal encounters. And what we'd really like to look at from here is what are the morphologies and what are the differences between these arms that you can form? And how does the gas and other properties of the disk depend upon the spiral arm method that you've used to generate? And with that, I'm going to finish one more slide. I've come here from Japan, so I'm going to give you a very silly picture of two robots fighting on the disk of the Milky Way. Thank you very much for your time, and any questions? Okay, any questions for Alex? 
Uh, so for those galaxies that you showed, which look like their arms could have been formed by a companion that goes by, can you put constraints on where that companion should be now? And could you like go find it? Uh, yeah, I don't don't see why not. So uh, we're not. That part, of the simula uh, that part of our investigation, we're not really looking at a galaxy-by-galaxy -galaxy basis at the moment. It's more of a, here is a test galaxy. What can we drive and reproduce? But in theory, the next step is to then start to see, well, which one of these look like actual galaxies? Redo it, make a rotation curve that matches exactly, reproduce the spiral arms, and yeah, where is the companion now? Is it in the disk? Is it on the edge of the disk? What has happened to it? Can we see it? So, and then maybe start looking for it if you are and need something, even if it's very light. So we're going to push the masses down as low as we can go and see what we can drive and maybe there'll be something needed. So you used a lot of uh, molecular gas line of site velocity measurements. Are there other pieces of, of, of kinematic information or structural information you can use, like say pulsar dispersion measure? Yeah. You need to check for so additional data. There's quite a toolbox actually of stuff that we could be using. So the obvious one is a rotation curve. It has some asymmetries in it. You can look at it in the left and the right galactic quadrants, and it differs. So that's another thing we can look at. But that's kind of built into those CO right. longer two velocity maps. Uh, those tangent profiles that I showed you, we could generate those and map to those. Like, where are your tangencies? Do ours match exactly? Uh, but yeah, there is other data, like the pulsar data, the OB star data, and dispersion rotation measures. And so to do so, we'd probably have to generate our own some kind of an Analog analogous thing to compare it to, right? So we are generating molecular gas, so it's very easy to generate a synthetic emission map. If we wanted to, say, start looking at positions of pulsars, do we then just trace that into, do we randomly distribute them in our stellar disk? So, yeah, yeah, sure. But I guess there's quite a few things to use. We chose what is more uniform, what is existent throughout the entire disk, and clearly traces the spiral arm structure. Which the CO gas is believed to do. Right. You know, if you look at the other disk in H1, it warps. Yeah. So, what would you do to create that? So, the warp, I believe, doesn't really come into effect until you're looking at like 15, it's quite far out, right? Where the warp begins to really dominate. So, and as such, uh, where on earth was that? Actually, I'm not even going to bother to try and find it. So we don't think it really has an effect on these longitude velocity maps in this kind of range. So when you start looking at 20 kiloparsecs out from the edge, you're getting very high away in your wings of those velocity plots. So we haven't included it, but we also don't think it's going to have much of an effect in the data that we're looking at. But it comes from somewhere. Is that oh, you mean in terms of yeah. what's generated from? Yeah. I don't know. I, know. I know it exists. I'm not sure the mechanism I mean, just formed. By, is it disturbed by the LMC and the SMC? Maybe? Like, what's caused the disk to slightly perturb like that? I don't know. I'm not an expert on. So the disks that you then ran a test part of another galaxy by, how far out did they go to start with? Uh, we start off, well, I'd say about 100 kiloparsecs. And their closest approach is about 20 to 30, depending on model. And is there disk material that's going out to? Mm, Halo, yes, disk, no. We truncate the disk at about 20 kiloparsecs. And then the arms can come out into that post 20 kiloparsecs. Yeah, they could. But there's nothing there to start with. Yes, they could if they wanted to go further out and just be pulled away by the perturber as it goes, yeah. Is there a need for um, a mechanism which can give you stable spiral arms or can you just explain everything? seeing the combination of transient arms and type interaction with the bar and the whole uh, As far as I'm aware, no. And that's kind of, I guess, half of the point that this is a theory that's been around for the past, pushing 60 years now, I guess, for the standing spiral waves. And there's no direct need or evidence. The only way you need it is to have a fixed pattern. If you observe a fixed pattern speed as a function of radius in your disk for your spiral arms. So, if you were to see that, you'd have to have a, arms that aren't winding up. The arms have to be fixed features. But usually when you study the pattern speeds of external galaxies, you'll either, you'll either assume a single pattern speed when you do your analysis, or you'll take just a few points as a function of radius. And this, when, when this is actually done, and you look at it as a function of radius, 
you do see a decay. So there needs to be a lot more studies of pattern speeds <coughs> in external galaxies as a function of radius. It's quite difficult to do. You stuff called the Tremaine Weinberger method. It can be done, but there's only about there's only a few galaxies it's been done for. I think you talk about angles. Do the grand design spirals are a little bit more difficult to explain in these transient pictures, right? Yes, the big grand, yeah. But some fraction of them it seems you can just have a time interaction and that'll give you You need a fairly massive companion. Yeah, so for M fifty one they have to for example is a very big, very massive companion interaction. Um, Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's probably difficult. Yeah, so there is a space where you can tell by observations it needs something heavy enough. But there's a paper by my old um, supervisor, Claire Dobbs, who reproduces very nicely M51 actually, and you get the spiral arms all the way to the center right. with a companion. But again, the companion is quite heavy, and the galaxy is gone after about a gig year after that snapshot. Like it comes in and it just. Yeah, at that point, it's beautiful. Afterwards, it's just all gone, which. M51 maybe, right? Like, <laughs> cool. Well, um, tonight we'll be going out for dinner uh, with Alex. So if anybody would like to come, please let me know in the next, next few hours. We'll be out to get to Hamilton tonight, so we'll be going earlier than usual, more like 6, 6.30, and I'll send an email. So please let me know about that. Uh, in a minute, we'll go upstairs for cookies. Uh, but before we do so, let's just